Hello everyone and welcome to another episode. Most space scientists today have a new dream. They want to see space travel not as rocket science anymore but as a method of frequent public transport. Many scientists all over the world have been working for several years on different aspects in the entire jigsaw of making this possible. One such scientist has been working for over a decade on just the material to make such frequent space travel possible. It is a wonder material made of carbon, but arranged in the form of singular molecular walled nanotubes, which make it 100 times stronger than steel and have various important properties. The name of the scientist is Kaladhar Reddy, who featured in BBC as India's spaceman. Kadadhar is the founder and CEO of NOPO Nanotechnologies, where NOPO stands for Not Possible, which symbolizes the immense impossible task he has undertaken to manufacture this material. Today, NOPO has caught the attention of Tesla, Indian Navy, various American space and defense organizations, and has also featured in Pakistan's official defense website. Gadadhar himself is a Shevening scholar from Oxford University. Let us find out more about this wonder material and what it can do for space travel from the man himself. As humans have evolved in technology, we are now able to decide how the atoms need to be aligned, how they need to be connected, so we can get materials with the properties we want. So we get to play designers for materials, we get to design properties, and we get to get those properties. Like ultimately, the goal would be to replace metals. So all the mining is going to go beyond Earth, and Earth is going to be like this uh, safe, nice place with humans living in a few cities and lots of activities happening in space. The entire transistor or the switch that goes into that circuit is still pretty big. It's about 50 nanometers in size. Now, with a carbon nanotube, we can reduce that size down to the size of a single nanotube, which means like we can get it at about 0.8 nanometers or 0.9 nanometers for the entire transistor. So Kroto found that this carbon doesn't make any sense because it's not matching up with anything that we have here. Within a year, uh, all three, uh, they were given a Nobel Prize jointly. So we manufacture nanotubes uh, with an accuracy, with an error of about two atoms in diameters. And we are now developing processes to achieve zero atom differentiation. Like I'm from India and I wanted to put, build things here. Bangalore happens to be the center for all the space activities uh, in India. It also happens to be a center yeah. for all nanotech activities and all biotech activities. In India, like the other major advantage uh, I found was there's a huge enthusiasm. The smallest nanotubes that have been made were 50 nanometers in size uh, at some of the premier institutes. And I was going around telling I'm going to make nanotubes of less than one nanometer in size. And they're like, okay, you must be mad. Like there's from an Indian perspective, I'm sure that all weddings will happen in space with everyone <laughs> and before we go into the interview what are carbon nanotubes carbon nanotubes are cylindrical shaped hollow tubes that consist of rolled up sheets of single layer carbon atoms bonded in a hexagonal pattern when not rolled up that single layer sheet is known as graphene which is also considered as one of the strongest materials known to us Gadadhar, welcome to the show. Great to have you. A great delight to see you and a uh, great delight to meet you again after International Space Development Conference. Yeah, and likewise. Thank you, Jay. Thanks for making the time. Very warm welcome to you. So, uh, NOPO Nanotechnologies, uh, which uh, manufactures single walled carbon nanotubes. Now, you have uh, named your company in such a way that disproving the very name of your company is what you're working for every day with a lot of effort and succeeding. So tell us a bit about this wonder material that you're manufacturing and how it, what, why is it particularly important to revolutionize space travel? Sure, Jaya. Yeah, thanks for that. Yep. Yeah, so, uh, so my journey uh, with space started from a fascination as a kid looking up at stars and seeing them beautifully shine and beckoning. So that's what that's how my journey has been. And so when I look at uh, our advances, like rocket science is incredible. It, it's the most extreme form of engineering that we have today. 
And the limitation for us has been the materials themselves, which is what sets the limits uh, for progress. If you look at things historically, like when people crossed the Atlantic and Pacific, it was because new materials were found that allowed to build uh, lighter and safer craft that were able to sail much further and go faster. So similarly, as we look at projections and trajectories, like as aluminum came into Fort 8, was, it was able to help build airplanes, which helped us conquer the skies. And similarly, to get to space, uh, we need something that's, we need vehicles that are extremely safe. And they're not uh, like the current man-rated vehicles, which can only have a 99.9% .9 reliability, which is still quite dangerous, which means on a, a, a thousandth trip, somebody is going to die and it's fine, which is ridiculous. Like on a vehicle that you're supposed to travel uh, across the, the solar system and stuff. So that is where uh, I looked at uh, as a solution, like what is it that we could do? Now, traditionally, the approach to materials has been to go after what the earth can provide, refine it and take out what we can get from it or prepare an alloy with the materials and combinations of themselves. But lately what's happened is uh, as humans have evolved in technology, we are now able to decide how the atoms need to be aligned, how they need to be connected. So we can get materials with the properties we want. So we get to play designers for materials. We get to design properties and we get to get those properties. So one uh, uh, such material that I found you have uh, people used to think of finding new elements as this key to uh, finding a different material that can serve their purpose but today you have an existing element which is actually arranged in a way so that it yep. uh, creates a different form that you think is perhaps a key to space travel and what you think is a limiting factor to space travel today is the material True. That's right. That's precisely put together. <laughs> and among the materials, it's, it, has, it always comes down to the strength and light weighting. Because if we have a stronger material, we can build safer vehicles with more safety features built inside them, which makes it, which opens it up for everybody, not just a, a few people who needs to be in the Air Force test pilots to be able to travel up there and, and stuff. And so that's the challenge that, I, that we have taken up. And uh, so precisely for the points you mentioned, we are working on carbon nanotubes which is an assembly of atoms of carbon uh, in a form that gives them a very high strength. So that is uh, what we're creating. So is this material meant for creating the spacecraft or is this, uh, can you tell a few different uh, areas in which you, you want to use this material in space travel? Yeah, sure. So my uh, goal towards starting this material uh, was to use it for its strength and its properties. And what I realized uh, soon enough was that... the strengths that you're talking about. I mean, there are uranium, which is strong. There is tungsten, which is strong. So give us a strength, of, uh, a sense of why this is particularly strong. Sure. So among all the various uh, bonds that exist in nature between elements, the sp2 bond is one of the strongest. And carbon can form a long chain with sp2 bonds. So in terms of numbers, now the best steel that is used in vehicles today and aircraft is the maraging steel. It has a strength of two gigapascals. Carbon fiber that's used for aircraft is about 4.5 gigapascals. The best carbon fiber that money can buy today is 7.5 gigapascals. And single wall carbon in nanotubes. In terms of uh, practical use, when you talk of gigapascal, one gigapascal is how strong? Can you give us a practical sense of it? Or maybe a sure. gigapascal uh, is how strong? Yeah, sure. Like, uh, so one uh, sense of looking at it is like a gigapascal is like five times stronger than a copper wire. Like imagine a copper wire and you want to pull it apart and five times higher than that is one gigapascal. And uh, on a carbon nanotube scale, we're looking at a strength of 127 gigapascals. Oh. So that is like significantly higher. And, and maybe uh, like one other analogy is probably going to be like a hair tensile strength. Maybe that could be a good comparison. So hair is about the same strength as a copper wire. It's about 200, uh, um, 0 0.2 gigapascal is the strength of a hair strength. 0.2? Yeah. Oh. And is the strength of one hair strength. gigapascal for carbon nanotubes. Okay. That's right. Yeah. So it's significantly higher. And uh, so when it comes to even metals and some metal wires, are they are about 10 times stronger than hair strands are and nanotubes are 100 times stronger than the metal structures are. So that's where uh, they come into picture. The challenge uh, has strength, been- A few other things, could you tell? What is particularly special about it? 
Yeah, sure. So nanotubes, uh, so in space, yeah, strength is just one of the factors. There's also ability to resist radiation and there's the ability to be able to conduct heat and electrons. So nanotubes come in with a bunch of bonus features. So they are the best thermal conductors. So along their axial direction, they can conduct heat almost like a diamond. And diamond is known to be the best heat conductor. Just to give a comparison, uh, among metals, the one that's popularly used is copper. And diamond is about, uh, so, and the numbers that we use as metrics is about 400 watts per meter Kelvin for copper. So diamond and nanotubes, they go up to 2000 uh, and 2500 watts per meter Kelvin. So almost uh, about a six to seven time higher thermal conductivity than copper does. So it do also has... Why hmm? thermal conductivity is a very important feature for space uh, engineering? Sure. So uh, with nanotubes, uh, okay, so they, they actually have this ability to both conduct heat and they can also block heat. So when we are in the cold of space, it's important that we are able to like contain uh, that temperature. And also when we have engine elements and stuff, we need a surface that can actually radiate away a maximum amount of heat so that we don't end up overheating the systems. And having a very high thermal conductivity actually provides that means that you can take away the heat from a surface and radiate it out into space because that's the only mode of uh, emission that's present in space. You can't have any kind of conduction or convection. And another very interesting property for nanotubes is an ability to conduct water molecules. So uh, I, I'm using this word conduct for water molecules because it's it's a very it's a new way of looking at it. So it turns out uh, that uh, as an example, in our bodies, we actually have structures called aquapores. Now, aquapores are tiny tubes that are present in our cell structures, which allow water molecules to pa pass through them into our cell walls. So that's how these membranes are so efficient at conducting water. And this makes them one of the like like the, the best possible water uh, transport mechanism that exists after billions of years of evolution. Now, these structures, people have looked at, okay, this is amazing. Like this is this outperforms our existing membranes, such as RO membranes. And if there was a way to synthetically create them, we could actually make them as physical structures. Now, the reason why this structures is important is... for human body, structures for life sciences. Is that what you mean? Yeah, structures for uh, membranes. So we could make synthetic membranes that could be used for water transport. So we could extract out clean water from any kind of dirty sources. So which, uh, in, in my longer term vision, what we... Uh, this, this was something we found much after we founded NOPO. That, okay, so no man, let's say we are in this world where we have been able to create all these materials, we're able to get off the planet, we're able to go to other planets. Now, ultimately, what humans need is water. We need we need to have water because without which we cannot survive. And so we, the material has the ability to actually create water filtration devices and extract out clean water. Now, this is something it can do anywhere, and it can also do it on Earth. So it solves like a major problem here. And the mechanism is it uses is the same thing that the aquapores does. So it turns out serendipitously that these very small nanotubes actually behave like aquapores. And so we can leverage that effect to create membranes that can provide clean water uh, right here, right now. So that's and something- And come to the other see. uses of it later. Um, <laughs> and that is a separate question that I have where I want you to give all these inputs. Uh, for now, I would like to, uh, so what we have understood is it is a very good conductor of heat. It's a good conductor mm -hmm. of electricity. And um, it is actually something that can uh, move water. Is that anything to do with space, the, the water permeation that it allows? How is that uh, suitable for space? Yeah. So this is more uh, currently still in the realm of science fiction. It's still uh, getting towards reality. So conceptually, uh, like water, uh, like so it's easy to break down water into hydrogen, oxygen, the amount of energy required is only about 1.5 electron volts, uh, thereabouts. Now, what this means is if you're able to apply a voltage, minimum voltage of at least 1.5 volts to water, we can actually produce hydrogen oxygen off of it. Now, the sunlight actually has enough energy uh, in terms of wattage to be able to do that. So, I mean, theoretically, if uh, water was not uh, transparent uh, to sunlight, we, water, the sunlight would be sufficient to vaporize all the water and break it down into hydrogen and oxygen because the sunlight actually has enough energy. So if we are able to provide a surface, like a small structure, on which this voltage can be generated directly from sunlight on water, we can actually break it down into hydrogen and oxygen. So, so that's something that's doable. That it can do. Oxygen yeah, is so it can do it as... by using this material. 
Uh, yeah. So one form of nanotubes called a semiconducting nanotube, they actually generate these voltages. So when put in a cell solution, it's a reaction that's called photocatalytic, uh, photocatalytic decomposition. Uh, so the, currently, one of the material candidate material that exists is titanium dioxide. And nanotubes just do it more efficiently than titanium dioxide. So that's one application that I see. So when in space to produce fuel, you directly have a mechanism for doing that. So that's uh, one use case. It's like every aspect of what we need in space, this material seems to have everything inside it, everything contained inside it. It can also withstand radiation. And so carbon has this ability that it, when you have a few carbon atoms break from high energy particles, they can actually put, put themselves back together. They don't become brittle like most plastics do. So that's the reason why graphite and carbon are used very widely in nuclear reactors. So you have like all of these multiple advantages, strength, conductivity, radiation resistance, and as a bonus feature of uh, water conductivity. So these are all the abilities that the nanotubes have that make them ideal for space usages. I have seen that uh, a few very interesting companies are uh, got a lot of attention. I mean, ha have a lot of interest in your company, which includes Tesla, Indian Navy, and I know for sure of various American defense and space organizations we, who are hugely excited about your company. Tell us a few of the uses that these companies are looking for with uh, your material. Sure. So uh, it comes down uh, also to your previous question about the longer term use cases of nanotubes. So it turns out that when we make uh, tubes of specific diameters, like in the region that we are working uh, on right now, so these nanotubes have both semiconducting and metallic properties, which means uh, you can have certain number of tubes which are definitely having the semiconducting properties, which is what makes them ideal for electronics and for this breaking down of water molecules. The metallic tubes, on the other hand, are highly conductive. So one area we're looking at as an application of the nanotubes is to make conductive surfaces that are way more conductive than copper is, significantly lighter. So this allows, uh, for example, one uh, MOU that we have that's in the public domain uh, is with Lockheed, uh, which was to explore the use of metallic nanotubes for aircraft structures uh, here. So we could lightweight uh, those structures. So that's some lightning strike protection of uh, vehicles using these metallic nanotubes. That's one area that's being explored. With the Navy, we are working on water filtration. Uh, we're developing these membranes uh, with their support here. And so we are expanding on that scope of work now, uh, along with them to look at more use cases for them. And our longer term uh, strategy for me and my vision is that we want to be able to leverage the nanotube. So we have all of these other properties we're leveraging, but strength is what's like closest to me. So this requires nanotube production in the thousands of tons. So that's an area we're working towards by adding capacities and meeting more of these current applications. And the shorter term, we are mostly looking at uh, the nanotubes meeting requirements in electronics, in water filtration. And uh, in the next uh, few uh, years or like a couple of uh, months time frame to be in the batteries too. That's an area that we are targeting. So we, we're like taking it as a step-by-step -step approach. Like ultimately the goal would be to replace metals. So we can use carbon as a structure that's there for everything that we use. So it's kind of like, um, like a weird turnaround, like where we are like scared of carbon dioxide and we're using that to make a material that replaces all the metals that we utilize on an everyday basis. Right, as you started by saying that the in interest in space started with seeing the stars and hence what you are trying to do is perhaps make a method to frequently go there. So uh, could you tell me how nanotubes, I mean, this material, uh, with that, what are you trying to achieve in terms of, I mean, going to space? What is the what is the dream about how frequently you are thinking of going to space with it? Sure, definitely. So my the interest that comes in uh, for me is like, okay, so today we have amazing vehicles that have been built to limits with the finest perfection, the finest engineers having done that. So uh, one limitation I see is these are vehicles that are like multiple components put together and they're derived from missiles that were used to deliver payloads, which eventually started delivering humans. So what uh, I envision is that we are able to rebuild uh, these things, not as missiles, but as people carriers and cargo carriers, but designed from the ground up, uh, not to be weapons, but to be the systems that deliver and for this, uh, I envision the vehicles not to be multiple stage vehicles because now we have access to a lighter weight material. So I envision that to be a single stage uh, to orbit vehicle. 
that uses the narratives as one of the core elements for being uh, building upon it. So to realize that uh, I knew that that does not happen unless the material exists. So the first phase of my journey was to figure out the material itself, figure out how to make that material and how to get it uh, to a larger scale and to do it in a sustainable manner so we can actually grow and that could then uh, lead to the next set of activities. So I took the longer drawn approach of patiently building out each step of it. And uh, currently I'm in the current, the first phase of building it out uh, and getting it out there. Because when we started, it was thought to be impossible to make nanotubes of these dimensions repeatedly. And now it's possible to do that. So next, uh, it's now people say it's impossible to build a single stage to orbit vehicle. So we'll take up that challenge next. <laughs> and uh, at some point we'll make that happen. You... Your basic dream was to see a frequent uh, travel to space possible without uh, without the debris, without uh, the loss of um, uh, payload, etc. And you went to find out what is the right material to make that possible, to make a frequent yeah. uh, travel to space possible. And with that, you narrowed it down to nanotubes, and then you started manufacturing. It's a it's a very, very risky, audacious journey, I can understand. So what is the uh, raw material that you need for this? What is the raw material? Yeah, so there's an interesting uh, reason behind the choices. So we use uh, a chemical, uh, so we, we use iron and carbon monoxide. So a chemical uh, derivative of iron is, what is the catalyst that we utilize in this process. So the thought process behind choosing only these, because there's a lot of options out there, like people can use methanes, acetylenes, all of it is on the table. So for me, I envision like, say one day we go to Mars and Mars has a lot of carbon dioxide or we go to Venus, Venus has a lot of carbon dioxide. Now carbon dioxide is heated with lack of air, you end up getting carbon monoxide. So if there is a lot of monoxide and that's a great raw material that's available in all these places, and iron is available in plenty, like Mars has its red from all the iron oxides. So there's a way to get iron. So let's choose the raw materials that's available there too, like uh, in any of these places. So that's that was something that decided uh, the choice between raw materials. So I stuck you with carbon monoxide. From the, you want to mine it from other planets and create your material. That's your dream. You want yeah, so I, yeah, I strongly believe that we will be a multi-planetary species. And we will need uh, materials everywhere. Like, so let's say we go to these outer planets and we're actually mining stuff, sending it back to Earth. We will need to build vehicles there. And it, it, I know it's like far out there, but still it's like, okay, it's going to happen. Like I believe in that. So start looking at, okay, what can we get from there? What can we utilize? And how can we create these materials there that could actually like, you know, get us back here or get us to move even further out and stuff. So. That, that was the choice that we thought and we built things for that right now. And so, and it like, it also happens that CO2 happens to be a problem that's identified here. So it's, it's good. It's a good problem for us to have because that's exactly what we want to convert. Wonderful. Uh, now tell me a bit, there are many companies in the world who are uh, manufacturing nanotubes. Where does NOCO stand out? What is special about your company? Sure. Yes, we do have uh, quite a few companies. Most of them have been like it's it's just a handful of countries that actually have the technology right now. So each one of us has a different application and a different size of tube uh, in mind. So uh, like for example, uh, when it comes to nanotubes themselves, there are two broad categories called multi walls and single walls. And uh, in multi walls, there are already thousand ton capacities and productions happening worldwide. The Koreans have taken the lead on that. When it comes to single walls, that's more of a niche uh, market at this point, but it's seen as something that can easily get into the multi-wall segment because of their uh, like more repeatable and vaster properties. So what uh, we have seen is uh, one what is, is the other multi single wall versus multi wall. So you are manufacturing single wall carbon and tubes. That's What's correct. The advantages uh, over multi. -wall? Sure. So. Uh, as a basic difference, uh, multi-wall nanotubes are like Russian dolls. Like you have multiple tubes inside each other, but a single wall tube is just one single tube of carbon. Now, and when you say wall, it is one one molecular thick wall, isn't it? The thickness of yep, the an atomic one layer. Yep, yep, yeah. Just like you have one atom of carbon thickness, that's it. That's the wall thickness. So the challenge is uh, multi-walls are uh, like, so they're significantly easier to produce when compared to single walls. Single walls require more energy, 
when we take a comparison on the strength, single walls have the highest strength when compared to multi walls. They are like significantly lower when compared to single walls. And also, when it comes to these semiconducting properties, it's only observed in single wall nanotubes. It's not seen in the multi wall nanotubes. And the metallic conductivity that we see that's also like high, like specific conductivity that we see is significantly higher in the single walls over multi walls. So the multi walls are a huge jump up over, over carbon black and carbon fibers. And nano, single walls are a huge jump over multi walls. Oh. That's how they are. Okay. So certain applications, they're happy with multi walls. They don't really require the extreme of precision and also the extreme improvement in properties that single walls offer. While certain applications are not at all feasible with uh, without single walls. Okay, so are you the only see. company uh, manufacturing single walled carbon nanotubes? Uh, there no, are there are. Uh, uh, where yeah, does there, your company uh, fare over others? Yes, there are a few uh, other companies. There are about two dozen companies across the planet. Okay. And uh, various companies have different technologies. With each one's targeting different sectors at this point of time. So where we differentiate ourselves from is that we are able to produce uh, some of the smallest diameter of these nanotubes. And we're also able to produce them with a very high consistency. And uh, we are also on a larger scale production, we are able to get them to a price point that uh, is difficult for any other competitor to get to. So that's something that we have as an advantage. And, and also for very the high- consistency part, sorry to interrupt you because the consistency you mentioned, how important is that? Yes, uh, so uh, for some of the applications, precision applications that we are targeting, it's actually very, very critical. So what uh, what we mean by the precision is like, so currently with no post material, so we manufacture nanotubes uh, with an accuracy, with an error of about two atoms in diameters. And we are now developing processes to achieve zero atom differentiation, like to get to that for certain customer usages, which can, uh, particularly in electronics and stuff. Now we are actually are, are on the cusp of having that technology. We are fine tuning that right now. So this is uh, the, our approach, like very, very fine, like within two atoms of diameter. So what happens is uh, when we're looking at specific properties, like say the band gaps between nanotubes or the ability to conduct electrons, this varies with diameter. So by having a product that's always within that diameter range and always has the same diameters on it, makes the output also consistent. So in terms of usage, how does the consistency matter in terms of, can you give a few use cases where it can make a huge difference? Sure, I can start with just water itself, water filtration. Mm -hmm. Now water filtration works very well when nanotube diameters are about 0 0.8 nanometers. If it's larger than that, uh, the, the tubes don't reject salt molecules, so you have a lot of salt entering it. If it's too small, it will reject all the salt, but it'll also reduce the amount of water flow. So if we have all tubes of precisely that diameter, we get the highest possible water flow through the structure. So that's uh, like how one uh, small change makes such a huge difference. So when we have a sampling of tubes over various diameters, and if those diameters keep changing, the amount of water that flows through keeps changing. So that's uh, how it becomes inconsistent. Similarly for electronics, we need tubes of the same diameter because the band gap of carbon nanotubes, it varies uh, with the diameters. So we wanna make sure that the band gap is consistent. And the only way to ensure consistent band gap is maintain exact size of the tubes. What do you mean by band gap? So uh, when we uh, take a semiconductor, like so one of the ways semiconductors work is, so they have, uh, so one way of visualizing semiconductors is that every material, it has something called a valence band. It has a conductor, conduction band. So the electrons are trying to uh, jump to the conduction band. Now, with, when it comes to like a semiconductor, the electrons are not in the conduction band. They're all at the top level. So when you apply energy, the electrons can move above. And once they cross the barrier, now they are in the conduction band and they can conduct electrons. So you need a specific voltage post which the semiconductor becomes a conductor. Now, when we use silicon, uh, this band, that this gap that exists between both of these regions, that's called the uh, band gap. Now, silicon for an electron to get to the conduction band, it has to make a few hops. Like, so when you make a jump on it, it goes to an intermediate step and then gets to the top level. So when it has to come back, it has to do the same thing. It cannot come back directly to its uh, like valence state. So when I was in a carbon nanotube, depending on how we twist the nanotube, so this particular band gap or the friction for the electrons to move towards it, it can be overcome and it has a different voltage for each uh, tube based on its diameter. 
So that is something that uh, can be controlled. So we can actually have, like, say, we apply one volt of voltage that allows electrons to pass, or we can make it two volts for it to pass, or three volts to make it pass, and so so on. So that's uh, that's the band gap, and that's what the nanotubes uh, provide and can actually help to hop the electrons across. So it is very precision voltage that you can predict from beforehand if you have the consistency and the right uh, size uh, that you're talking yep. about. So that is what you need. That's the most essential part to have the precision of the voltage to make it uh, jump, uh, to make the electrons jump. Yeah, yeah. And this is for the applications we are targeting electronics, where this is a critical factor. So we are taking this approach of first targeting markets that require very high precision and then use that to scale our production so we can meet requirements in other sectors because having the finest tubes and going from there to the other tubes is is what we believe is the right pathway for the material to actually make a huge difference to the world. So tell us a bit about these uh, industries where which needs this uh, precision uh, uh, band uh, that you're talking about. Yes, uh, so electronics uh, is the main industry that requires this. And so here it's about replacing transistors, like in current electronics, uh, these structures that we have for electron for the... So today, the smallest chips that we can talk about, the finest engineering, is the three nanometer chips. Now at three nanometer, uh, so what it actually means is the smallest feature size that goes into the chip, it has a size of three nanometers. But the entire transistor or the switch that goes into that circuit is still pretty big. It's about 50 nanometers in size, uh, of a square of 50 nanometers. So which means, uh, like, even though the technology node says 3 nanometers, the actual structure that sits there is 50 nanometers in size. Now, with a carbon nanotube, we can reduce that size down to the size of a single nanotube, which means, like, we can get it at about 0.8 nanometers or 0.9 nanometers for the entire transistor. So that means we can now pack in significantly more transistors in a given area, reduce the energy draw, and have more compute power. So imagine uh, an iPhone or a phone coming out, like say five, six years down the line, uh, and it has like can be paper 100 thin. times more computing. It yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's lightweight, it uses lesser energy, but it has 100 times more compute. And this is how technology has progressed, like in electronics, and this is the pathway that we see it adopting towards getting there. So that's the advantage of the nanotubes of this precision manual. This is so very interesting. I'll ask you this. Uh, why did you, you, your company is right now in Bangalore. Why did you choose Bangalore to set up a company which is meant for space tech? If you could have chosen the US. Yeah. So yeah, in fact, I did my studies uh, in the US. Uh, I studied in Louisiana. And then later I went back, uh, was spending a little bit of time at a place called Singularity University at NASA, Science Research Center. So it has to do with quite a few factors. One being that I'm from India and I wanted to put, build things here where I'm more comfortable with and have people. In India, like the other major advantage uh, I found was there's a huge enthusiasm. There are certain, there are limitations that exist, like just like anywhere else. And I realized that the people here and in the US, they are very similar, like at the end of it, people everywhere are similar. They're not very different. Mm -hmm. It just comes down to like how we visualize things and how we see what we require. And luckily for me, Bangalore happens to be the center for all the space activities uh, in India. It also happens to be the center yeah. for all nanotech activities and all biotech activities. So everything uh, and electronics is like another major uh, area. Like Bangalore as the, is the center for most of the electronics initiatives. And in fact, the area that we work out of, uh, the place is called Electronic City. Like that was one of the first initiatives in electronics in the country. So I happened, and the, the close Silicon Valley Connect. So that kind of like brings in some of the best talent in the country in one place and gives me access to all the resources. So that is quite helpful. And it gives me like, like when I want to access like the best microscope available in the world, it's it's literally across the city. That's it. So... We, I, that has never been like a limitation or any kind of factor for me. Tell me a little bit. There is a lot of things that go into starting a business. I mean, technical side is just one side of it, but there's a business acumen. There is doing the re right research to find out your way in the market, etc. This whole journey, I have a lot of respect because first of all, it was a no-po, not possible journey. 
Secondly, it was you trying to find out your footing in the entire business world. So tell me a little bit about the uh, some of the most difficult junctures you have faced during this journey and how you overcame them. Uh, yeah, thanks for that, Jay. So yeah, yeah, it is an interesting journey. It requires uh, one to wear different hats at different phases of the company's life. So when we started off uh, with things, so I got support from an uncle like who had an automations factory. So like I, I went to him and I was like, okay, so I need to use this machine shop. I need to access this. And I, that is essential for me to build out this company. I can't really like you know, sit somewhere far away and just not be able to build stuff. So I convinced him uh, to give me an, uh, give me access. So I was able to like, you know, rent out a space and build up stuff and start building things there. Now, at that point of time, the whole goal and focus was like, okay, so this process called HIPCO uh, exists, but it's like highly uncontrollable. It's not consistent. And how do we even build a reactor for the first time that's able to produce a material? So when I went around uh, telling people about that, like, so in India back then, like around 2011 timeframe, the smallest nanotubes that have been made were 50 nanometers in size uh, at some of the premier institutes. And I was going around telling, I'm going to make nanotubes of less than one nanometer in size. And they're like, okay, you must be mad. Like, there's no way you can do that. There's no way anybody can do that. It's it's impossible. And another perspective is India has not yet made commercial carbon fibers. Carbon fibers are a thousand times larger than all of these sizes. So I, I was uh, dealing with something incredibly small. And so there was like a, a lot of like, okay, it's impossible to do this. That was motivating for me to start off with things. And once we started building up stuff, we realized that there are significantly more challenges. I would go to vendors. I would assume that, okay, so if this vendor has served the space program, there must be a very good vendor. And then I realized all the hardships the space program itself must have gone through to develop their vendor bases. We face the same issues that everybody else faced, where the reactors simply did not function or they would work very well one day, they would stop working and I just sit and watch like, okay, Tom, what do we do? Like we're doing everything the exact same thing. We're even wearing the exact same clothes and standing in the same direction. It's not working, what's going on? And much later we found those parameters to be, like each one, we, we, we'd go back again. Like, okay, so it's not working, fine. So I'll sleep over it, go back the next day, come back with the team and we go address everything, like fix it back again. And once we had the material, we thought, okay, so now we are on top of the world. We got the material and stuff. And then it's like, okay, no, like you need to sell this in a big way. And then you, then you have something. And we talked to VCs and they're like, okay, so you, you are still a big problem. That's great. But you have more in front. Like, who are you going to sell this to? Why are they going to buy this? And how is it going to make sense for them? And then it's another journey, like searching. Okay, so now I had to wear a different hat. And now I have to have a team that's going to be trained to run these things. And then, okay, so how do you run these things? Like, what's the procedure for that? How's the training going to work for that? What is the process for this? So figure out the processes and how do you ensure the process runs properly? Like, so it's like each phase has a different set of problems. Like once we had the process in place, it's like, okay, so now how do you like make sure that this is done exactly as you want it and does not have any deviations? So it, it uh, and that was something we found. We, we fortuitously were able to find people who could support and help us out with these things. And now uh, we got to a point where we're like, okay, so we have figured this out. We have figured out how to do this repeatedly. And we have figured out who can buy this material and why they need it. So now we go into the scale-up point. So that's uh, the approach uh, we took. I would like to ask you that, um, how long do you think, what is the kind of, give us a sense of the kind of cost of this kind of a material at the moment. And give us a sense of the kind of time you think uh, you can scale up to a uh, uh, to a practical level where it can be used in a large scale for something like a spacecraft. Sure. So currently, uh, we sell the nanotubes for around five hundred dollars as produced from the reactors. Price points of somewhere around three to five dollars uh, per gram of the nanotubes. It seems to be uh, an area that's that's realistic to start eliminating metals in the structures. And that's an area that we have uh, within our eyesights. We think that it's something that's achievable when it comes to scale. And that's uh, something that's ongoing right now. So the timelines on that are currently, we are working with our customers, looking at what their requirements are and what their scale of needs are, because that is what defines uh, the price points for them. So that's how we are working towards it. 
So, and and further uh, beyond that is going to be like, as we come into more domestic use cases, that's going to have its own price points. So, and, and eventually prices will approach the price of raw materials, which is iron and carbon monoxide. So that's probably going to take a much longer time, like probably another two or three decades by which it will arrive at the commoditized uh, prices, or it might happen even faster too. So, because at that point we're producing millions and millions of tons of the material. So let's say if you are in an earth where you are producing millions and millions of tons of carbon and you at a very cheap rate, give me an idea of where you think space travel can be in an earth like that. Yes, definitely. I think uh, in such a scenario, we would be we'd we'd all be traveling regularly. So like uh, you know, like on a funny note from an Indian perspective, I'm sure that all weddings will happen in space with everyone <laughs> going up there because it's just so easy to go up in space. It's like way better than like you know just being here and regular travel across. And I'm and I believe that this is going to be in hydrogen and uh, oxygen powered rockets rather than anything else that's going to be traveling and crisscrossing the planet. Travel uh, between any two locations, uh, even on Earth, would just be like 30 minutes away. It would no longer be a 24-hour or 36-hour journey like it is today. And also, like flying cars, there would be a de facto standard because they're using lighter weight structures, more efficient uh, batteries and energy sources inside them uh, with, the, with this material av available abundantly. And power lines uh, would be significantly more efficient because we'd be able to deliver energy uh, far more efficiently by using wires made of these nanotubes. So both the structures, energy delivery, and also space, I believe uh, what we're going to have is we, we will definitely be seeing orbital fuel stations. And I also envision that a lot of mining on Earth would be ground to a complete halt. Earth would be like more of a protected region with like fewer regions, like fewer cities which have more people, but everything else being in the wild with all the wild animals and stuff and all the minerals and mines and everything coming from off the planet. So because it's now like you have fuel depots and stuff where people can take up stuff and get it to Earth. So all the mining is going to go beyond Earth and Earth is going to be like this uh, safe, nice place with humans living in a few cities and lots of activities happening in space. So that's how I see it. So that utopia can happen as soon as this material can come into existence in a large scale and which you don't think is going to take huge amount of time, maybe one or two decades in which a scalable amount of this material can be made. And uh, what we see as plastics today, maybe that kind of a ubiquitous kind of material and that can transform transport to space as well as transform the entire way earth works today that's where you see it maybe in the next couple true. of years a uh, couple of decades right true true yeah that's wonderful my last question is i would uh, this is a very important question but i kept it for the last because i wanted everybody to hear about this material before i got to this tell me about the association of your company with the guy who started this and who won a Nobel Prize for the discovering or um, I don't think it's called inventing, it's discovering this, this entire uh, set of allotropes of carbon, like fullerenes and graphenes and et cetera, which started this enthusiasm for looking at this material. So your uh, company's association with the guy who won a Nobel Prize for this. Sure. So uh, the so there's a small backstory to like about the discovery of narratives that I've been piecing together. So I still need to get, get some of my references right on this. So for the, until then, it's like, you know, like you can think of it as a fictionalized account of things. So Kroto, uh, a professor in the US, so he was observing starlight. And in the starlight, he found uh, like there was a spectra of carbon that was coming through. It had some traces of iron, but it did not, the carbon itself did not look like any of the carbons that had been found on Earth. Like it was not part of like, so carbon was known to have seven other tropes. And that is what I read in high school too. So, and even though I was born right after the discovery of like other forms of carbon, so probably takes time for things to trickle down here. So, so Kroto found that 
this carbon it doesn't make any sense because it's not matching up with anything that we have here. So he ended up meeting Smalley in a conference and Smalley happened to have like one of the world's most powerful lasers. And he used that laser to fire it upon everything he could find. And Scroto was like, okay, so why don't you fire it on carbon and uh, with some of the iron inside it and see what happens. So they did exactly that. And they ended up finding that it was actually creating the sp same spectra as what had been seen in the starlight. So there was a similar spectra to starlight uh, in a lab-grown material. And then when they put it under a microscope and started testing it, uh, along with another professor called Curl, who came up with the theory to explain how it is formed, they had a new material on hand. And this material was fullerene. This was a C60 molecule, which was a carbon structure that seemed to resemble a football. And it was creating these spectra. So suddenly there was a huge interest and it got such a huge interest by within a year, uh, all three, uh, they were given a Nobel Prize jointly, a Nobel Prize in chemistry for the discovery of fullerene. Which year was this? Now, uh, this was 86, 1986. And so then multiple research groups across the planet started working on this uh, and everyone was excited, like, wow, like we, we have, we are carbon, like we are all completely made of carbon. Every life on earth is carbon. And suddenly you are saying that carbon has more forms than what we have understood over millennia. Like it's not just coal, diamond, graphite. It's something more exists out here. And people were stunned, like something like that could happen. And all researchers were working on this. And around the 91 time frame, uh, a Japanese researcher, he published a research uh, suggesting that this is not just uh, like football shaped molecules. You could actually stretch them to form tubular structures. And he called them nanotubes. Uh, and these were the single wall carbon nanotubes. And eventually people found more forms of them. Now, Smalley was again attracted towards the nanotubes. He was like, okay, so this is an amazing material. And what it holds for in scope is just mind blowing. Like, you know, a single material that can exhibit high conductivity, and it can exhibit semiconducting properties and all of these amazing things. So he started working on that. And prior to that, he had fine tuned a process called laser ablation. So like, since he had a laser, it's laser for producing nanotubes. And he'd started like programs across the country. He had gotten the DODs funding. He had gotten the US government interested. He set up a lab at a company called Carbon Nanotechnologies Incorporated. And they began work earnestly. And Smalley used to talk of wires, like long conducting wires, replacing all the power cables, and even like having transmission lines that span across continents and stuff. So he started work. So in his lab, uh, so one of the researchers in the lab, so they were like trying to produce nanotubes in a different way. They're okay, so we laser is there, it's amazing, but what if we do it differently? What if we take this mixture and try to mix it in a different way? And one of them, uh, what he did was he had a hunch that if he increased pressure, it's going to like produce better nanotubes. And he, even though the professor said like, don't do that, it's like, it's going to be harmful. He went ahead anyway. And he ended up producing uh, single wall nanotubes. So this was a work uh, that was uh, continued by a PhD student called uh, Kelly Bradley. And Kelly uh, was a small student who worked on the nanotube synthesis, nanotube progress, and he made a lot of inventions along with Smalley. And Kelly happens to be a co-founder in Novo. So that is uh, our connection to him. So Kelly was his PhD student. And uh, so Kelly uh, and Kelly, uh, he brings in a lot of the connects from Rice University. And that's how uh, we've built a very strong, close collaboration with the team. And HIPCO currently, it's a trademark of NOPO and we've continued developments massively. And we ended up creating a new process. Uh, but out of respect, we still call it the HIPCO process here uh, because uh, what, what we have been able to do is to produce nanotubes uh, using these higher pressures and it produced them in an incredibly consistent uh, manner. So that's, and solved the major problems that prevented HIPCO from scaling up in the first place in the US. So yeah, so that's been our connect to Smalley. And we started uh, five years after Smalley passed away. So uh, if I had, uh, if, if you were around, I'd probably have tried working for him. Uh, since he wasn't, I decided I'm gonna start one and build it out anyway. So. What a wonderful story. What a wonderful thing. I mean, uh, maybe m many people know about the new the, these new forms of allotropes that maybe everybody doesn't know exactly how it came to existence. I didn't know it. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing this. And uh, yeah. quickly, can you tell what's HIPCO? Uh, just what's the full form of HIPCO? 
Sure. So, HIPCO stands for high pressure carbon monoxide. So that's the process that we use for making the nanotube. So we use carbon monoxide under pressures, uh, high pressures and temperatures. So it's uh, so that's the name uh, given for that. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Gadadhar, for joining this show, for sharing such important and interesting things. I hope to see the earth that you envision. I hope it happens sooner than you expect. And you have a lot of expectations. And wish you a great journey because your the success of your journey is going to create a better earth. Thanks so much for joining. Hope to talk to you again as you proceed, as you progress with this. And a lot of interesting things happen in this field. Sure, Jaya. Thank you so much and appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks so much for talking. Thanks. See you See again. You. Bye. Bye.